Thank you for taking the time to watch this webinar. My name is Emma Mamo and I am Head of Workplace Wellbeing at MIND, the mental health charity. MIND provides advice and support to anyone experiencing a mental health problem. We also um, campaign to improve services, promote awareness and understanding of mental health problems. And MIND is leading a major new project called the Blue Light Programme, which is dedicated to helping to support the mental health of emergency services personnel. So people working within the police, the fire and rescue service, the search and rescue service and the ambulance service. And this will be working across England. The programme um, will focus on raising awareness and tackling stigma within the services. And it will then also provide training for line managers about how they can best support their staff. And it's also focusing on building the resilience amongst fire service personnel and helping them to manage their mental health. This webinar and others in the series have been made for emergency service personnel. Joining us to share their experiences of looking after mental health and well-being while working for the fire service are Andy Message, who is watch commander from Suffolk Fire and Rescue Service, and Jeremy Beard, who is group manager from West Sussex Fire and Rescue Service. So in this webinar we will talk about um, what is mental well-being, what do we mean by that and what can affect our mental well-being and what can be um, a trigger for poor mental health. Then we'll be talking about how to build resilience and stay mentally well, what are the kind of things we should do to, to, to achieve that and then some tips on managing your mental health at work um, while working within the fire service and then as I said we'll be hearing from the experiences of Andy and Jeremy. So in terms of mental well-being, what do we mean by that term? So it describes our mental state, how we are feeling and how well we can cope with the kind of stresses and strains of day-to-day -day life. And our mental well-being can change from day-to-day, -day, month to month or year to year. And if you have good mental well-being or good mental health, you are usually able to feel relatively confident in yourself and judge yourself on realistic and reasonable standards. You can feel and express a range of emotions. You can feel engaged with the world around you and can build and maintain positive relationships and, and contribute to your community. And also live and work productively um, and deal with you know, difficult times or times of change and uncertainty. And I will say that we all have times when we have low mental well-being, when we can feel sad or stressed or find it difficult to cope. For example, when we experience a loss of a family member or when we experience loneliness or relationship problems or we worry about work or money. And sometimes there's no obvious reason why we might be experiencing low mood or poor mental health. But we do know that there are some triggers that may cause or um, exacerbate um, a low mood. For example, if you are experiencing a long-term physical health condition, this can have an impact on your mental health. As I said before, experiencing relationship breakdown or divorce or separation. If you're experiencing any debt or financial issues or poor living conditions, being out of work can have a massive impact on your mental health. Experiencing violence or abuse um, or discrimination. Or if you're having to care for a family member who might be dealing with any of those issues. And if you experience significant trauma as an adult, such as being involved or witnessing um, a serious incident or being the victim of a violent crime. And then also thinking about the kind of work that you do. Obviously, the fire service can be quite a high pressurised, quite a high risk role, so that can have an impact on your mental health. And MIND commissioned some research to look at um, the impact of mental health for, for, for fire and rescue personnel and found that 85% have experienced stress and poor mental health at work. I think the challenging nature of the profession means that you are more likely to be exposed to challenging working conditions and traumatic events. But we also know that emergency services personnel are more likely to then experience a mental health problem than the general workforce, but are less likely to take time off work as a result. And I think there's quite a few reasons that might contribute to that, but I think there's something around people feeling comfortable to say that actually the job is having an impact on them. So if you experience low levels of mental well-being over a long period of time, you are likely to develop a mental health problem. If you already are living with a mental health problem such as depression or anxiety, then you are more likely to experience periods of low mental well-being than someone who hasn't. However, you can still have periods of good mental well-being where you are able to manage your condition and your life without becoming unwell. So I just want to be clear that just because you might experience a mental health problem doesn't mean you can't live a full and successful life. So 
when you have a, a mental health condition or not, um, there may be times or situations in your life that are more difficult than others. And the capacity to stay mentally well during those times is called um, resilience and how you can manage that. So in terms of MINDS model and what we say helps you to um, build your own resilience, it's about doing things that promote well-being in yourself and then building your social capital. So that's about having strong relationships, a strong social and support network, and then um, learning about um, psychological coping strategies that you can use. So I just want to talk in general some of the ways that you might be able to develop and strengthen your resilience so that you can deal with everyday life and face difficult circumstances without becoming unwell. But I will say we're all individuals, so you know, have a think about what really works for you and, and take notice of that and, and build that into your life. So the things that you can do, is, I think it's really important to talk about the way that you feel with friends and family um, or with colleagues. Um, I know that within the fire and rescue service, a number of services, um, hopefully a lot of them, provide an employee assistance program where people can access confidential support. And then, as I was saying before about building social capital, building relationships with the people around you, so your colleagues, your friends and family, and then looking after your physical health, so making sure you get good sleep, um, healthy eating, and then physical activity, which can really help with your mental health. And then also thinking about the stuff that you really enjoy doing, so cooking or other pastimes, and just making sure you're making enough time for that and having downtime to relax. And then also doing stuff for other people. We know that um, kind of doing voluntary work or helping others out can really boost your own well-being. And in terms of how to manage tough times, you know, everyone experiences difficult times. I think it's important not to put too much pressure on yourself to just carry on as normal. You may need to take some time out um, and being able to feel comfortable to say no to requests being made of you if you feel that that is too much at this time. And as I was saying before, again, it's really important to make sure you get enough sleep and are eating well. And I think it's also important and it's something I've struggled with myself, you know, just learn to accept that you don't have to be perfect and in control at all times. So in terms of managing your mental health while working within the fire service, I think it's very important to recognise you are in a highly pressurised job. You need to feel confident and motivated to perform well in your job, to then be able to effectively engage with and support your watch or colleagues and still undertake your duties. So the following are some suggestions to help you improve your mental health now or at a time when you might find yourself struggling. So. Um, as I was saying before, it's really important to try and build those relationships with your colleagues so you can draw on them if you are struggling. And then thinking about how you use the time leaving work and going home, you know, make sure that you can use that to kind of wind down and switch off from work. Um, and also if there have been challenging situations in the workplace, you know, does your work offer a kind of debrief process where you can talk to your supervisor or someone about what you've been through and, and the impact it's had and try and process that. And also, if you're provided with opportunities to have some input, input into decisions about how the watch is run or how your team is working, you know, take those opportunities so you can feel like you're in control of how your work is, is structured and so on. And find a way to voice your frustrations at work, but try to be constructive in, in raising any issues. And then, as I said, you know, asking for help if you feel that things are spiralling out of control. Take the opportunity to discuss it with your manager or supervisor. If you can't resolve the problem and if it relates to unrealistic expectations, then talk to colleagues in HR or a union representative or other relevant members of staff who can support you in addressing that issue. So if at any point you are feeling overwhelmed, I think that taking action, however small, will help you. Some of the things I'm going to outline now you may be able to just choose to do, but others you may need to negotiate with your watch or colleagues or manager in order to, um, to undertake them. So taking control by being proactive, think about what you need to do, talk to someone you trust at work or outside of work about what is distressing you or making you feel, dist making you feel stressed. And then, as I said, speak up if you need help and be assertive, you know, say no if you can't take on extra demands. And as I was saying, be realistic, you don't have to be perfect all the time. If everything starts to feel overwhelming, take a deep breath, maybe try and get away from the situation for a few minutes, take a walk. Um, you know, getting some exercise and daylight can be good for your mental health as well as your physical health. And then making sure you're drinking enough water and that you eat during the day to maintain your energy levels. 
And a great anecdote to stress is, you know, learning some relaxation techniques. We have a guide about how to manage stress, which has a few exercises and techniques that you can try out. For people experiencing a mental health problem or worried about their mental health, there is a range of support available for you to be able to talk to someone, um, whether it is about your well-being or any other concerns that you may have that may be impacting on your mental health. So any work issues, relationship issues, health, money, and so on. And what I will say that the kind of support you'd get within your organisation, the most beneficial will be where there is a positive culture around mental health and um, managers and supervisors are aware of mental health issues, how they can impact on how they can impact on someone's ability to do their job, but also how their job might be impacting on their mental health. So it's really key for the Blue Light Programme and for everything that's being done within the fire and rescue service to kind of take the necessary steps to supporting a more open culture of acceptance um, around mental health so people can get the right support at the right time. If you want to speak to someone perhaps outside of work, um, there are many sources of support available, um, including Minds Helpline, called the Blue Light Info Line, so these are trained advisors aware of the kind of um, operating environment that you're working in who can kind of give you advice around um, what support is available to you. Details of this and other sources of support and information will be given at the end of this webinar. So taking part in our webinars and here to share their experiences of working in the fire services are Andy Message and Jeremy Beard. So right now I'm going to hand over to Andy who's going to talk about his experiences of supporting a colleague with a mental health problem. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, uh, I'm a watch commander with Suffolk Fire and Rescue Service and I've been there for 10 years. Um, I work uh, on a watch, um, as a lot of people in the fire service do, um, and one of our guys on the watch developed a serious illness. And that it wasn't a mental health condition that he was, that he was diagnosed with, but... Um, but we knew he was going to be away from operational duties for at least a year mm -hmm. um, and it was going to be a long road for him. Um, straight away from the start we got really good support from um, those above us um, and letting him put getting well first. Um, and I think it's quite often you can feel like there's nothing you can really do to help someone who's in the hands of say the NHS um, with a physical condition but there is something that you can do by making their place of work somewhere um, which is not going to make them make things any harder for them to get back to work. So, so yeah, I thought it was very important that he was able to stay connected and part of the watch and still part of the environment, um, the station where he where he was used to working. Um, and it's really important to keep him involved and not letting his skills slip and his skills fade away. Or feel um, distant from the workplace. Yeah, oh yes, exactly, because I, you know, I'm sure that people can become quite isolated and, and, and then you've got a second set of problems getting someone back to work. Mm. Is, is not just the first reason why they were off necessarily, but also you've created another one. Some anxieties about returning. Yes, yeah, potentially, yeah, potentially, yeah, because um, because your confidence will go, um, it, it will it will wane if you're kept out of the loop and and you're not kept up to date with everyone and everything that's happening. So, so um, uh, I knew that if we didn't get those things right, that he could be off for longer, um, and that when he was finished with his with his primary reason for being off, we wanted to be able to get him back to where he was at the start as soon as possible. Um, so, so it's very important for us to keep him part of the part of the watch part of the part of the group, doing everything that we that he could. There were some things that we physically couldn't let him do, and he understood that. He couldn't maintain sort of competence wearing BA or, or using some equipment, but he could certainly, there was no reason why he couldn't be involved with all the theoretical input and all the changes and um, uh, differences to the way that we work. I mean, he could, and he could carry on doing those, so he still felt up to date. Yeah. So there were some things, no, he, he couldn't do, but there was a lot of things he still could do. It's important um, to focus on that. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. He um he and to make him still feel like he was part of the watch, he was valued by everyone. He um he had he had great flexibility in his working hours and 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 was supported really well from above and from his peers as well. So so other people on the watch, I think, were very good at rounding around, keeping around, which they tend to do anyway. As someone when when the, when the chips are down for someone, so so they were very good. And he wasn't given. Um, a wider range of duties which were unusual or left him working in isolation. He, he stayed with us and I'm very pleased that he did and, um, 
Um, I'm very pleased he's got back to where he is now. So, so um, um, he, if someone in my position, I would I would certainly say is, is that you might think there's nothing you can do if someone's diagnosed with with an illness which is which are you in the hand of medical professionals. You might think um, there isn't anything you can do, but there is a lot you can do actually because you can just you can keep you can keep someone busy, interested, motivated, um, and you can listen to what they want and and what they need and and you can you can make a positive difference to them getting back to work you can um, not give them a se second set of problems to deal with you, you can you can help people just by doing some very simple things and, and the first thing I think is just start listening to them and, and what they want so so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased it's a, it's a positive story um, uh, and and I'm very pleased with the support that we had so so I'd like to encourage people in my position managing someone, whether they're off for a, a, a reason of, of physical health or mental health, is, is to be able to have conversations with people and, and just talk about their mental well-being. And it certainly brought up on our watch, um, you know, just talking about mental health a lot, in a lot more a lot more depth and detail and being able to approach the subject about how people have felt. It's a it's a bit of a taboo subject at times. People don't want to come out and say something about it, but but we are getting better, I think. Just not talking about fire service, but but just people in general. But but I'm really pleased that mine are doing what they are, trying to encourage people to have a conversation about mental health. And I know within my organisation, they're very keen on pushing, trying to promote positive mental health. So so it was a good story. It was it was a good it was a good story, and and um, I definitely encourage people in my position to try and do the same. Perfect. Thank you. I guess that is the difficulty in workplaces though, once you say something you can't unsay it. Mm. And I think that's the real difficulty around mental health, it's still quite a, a stigmatised issue. Um, we have, as you said, we've seen public attitudes changing, but in the workplace it has been a bit of a lag and I think mm. it's because, you know, who can take the pressure, who can take the strain yes. and when does that become a tipping point? So yeah, it's about trying to create a culture where you're talking about, well, what do we do to promote good mental health and that then will encourage people to seek support if they are experiencing mm. poor mental health that they'll feel that they'll get a positive response yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, and it's um it's it, when you when you start talking about it at, at work you, you tend to find that you know everyone will chip in with the story whether they're comfortable talking about themselves first mm. or not sometimes they'll they'll want to use examples of oh, i know someone such as who, who this but but they but people do come out themselves a lot more mm. um and it was, it's been refreshing, I think, recently, sort of some of the conversations I've heard and, and, and taken part of to think that actually you, know, you can talk about these things. It doesn't need to be something that you bottle up, but, but, um, but it's a long road and, it's, and, um, and people maybe not feel confident coming out and saying something. Mm. But as a manager, you can't not, if people aren't saying something, you can't not deal with the symptoms of it. You, you yeah. can't not deal with the knock on effect in, in everyone at work. You have to, you have to, if someone's showing signs of poor mental health. You have to still deal with it, even if they're maybe a little bit more reluctant to it at first. But yeah. but it, it's really good to have that open environment where people can talk and they know that they can talk in confidence too. That's good. And I guess, you know, if you feel that you are seeing the signs that maybe someone is struggling or that their, their demeanour's changed or you're worried that, that it's having an impact on their mental health and mm. you choose to broach it with them yes. in whichever way you think is appropriate. You know, you, you know the people that you manage best. But I guess it's important to remember that although you're broaching it and you think it needs to be discussed at that time, that person might not feel ready. No. For that reason I just said, you know, once you say it, you can't unsay it and yes. people might want to think about what they want to share. I guess it's then just saying, well, you know, I'm here, mm. my door is open, when yeah. you're ready, if there is something going on that you need to share with me, I will support you, so come and talk to me. So I think that's probably quite important. Um, well, that's yeah. knowing the people that work, that yeah, work for you. Yeah, it's what you have a sense of. And, and some line managers will be more approachable than others, but they've all still need to do the same job. They still need to, so, so if you're not maybe as approachable as you could be, is there something that, that you, you can do for yourself? To, to make yourself more approachable and make yourself mm. one of those people that someone can come to and talk to. So, so have a have a look at yourself as well and think. Actually, do my watch or team feel comfortable talking to me about these things? Or if not, why not? You know, is this something I can do to myself for myself, which might help me along? So, absolutely. I mean, I do think it's quite challenging for managers though in terms of addressing those conversations. Mm. But I mean. I, you know, I manage um, people who are living with a mental health problem and at certain points you have to say, with the information we have now, 
I think that we should try doing this and let's review it in a week or two weeks and see if it's working and you have to just see how it is mm. and that can be quite scary sometimes but that is the only approach that you can take you know based on what we know now let's try this out in terms of a support measure or an adjustment and yeah. let's just see how it's working and tweak it and so on as it goes on so thank you Andy for kind of talking about how you supported a colleague and now we're going to hear from Jeremy talking about your own experiences yeah hi there um, I suppose setting the, the scene just to give you the background I've been married now for 25 years I've got two lovely grown-up daughters and I've been in the fire service for about 26 years. Wow. So in terms of wanting to sort of be part of today and sharing the journey, I think it's a bit about owning that and, and creating the space to enable other people to sort of feel it's okay to talk about it. So sharing my story, I, at the very beginning of my career, I, I was like a lot of um, people that are in the fire service, I had to do two jobs basically to just keep ends going. So I was working flat out. I, I had to build an extension on our house because the uh, the space we had with two young kids was quite small. and we, we couldn't afford to move, so I had to do that. And I thought I was pretty indestructible. It was pretty much 24-7, flat out, keep going. Um, I, I also had uh, a bit of a problem with um, some injuries. My shoulder, um, my right shoulder particularly, was really bad, and I ended up having three operations in the end and a couple of operations on my knee, which sort of brought me to a physical grinding halt that I wasn't really expecting. Um, and I think it was during that time when I was experiencing that, that a lot of other stuff, so it's interesting what Andy was saying about other illnesses and how there can be some relation with sort of ill health and, and mental ill health as well. Mm. But certainly those, that created a, a pause in, in what was quite a frantic and busy period in my life. Um, so the recouping, the, when I was recuperating from those operations, it, it dawned on me that looking back now, I recognised that I was also carrying some what I'd call historical sort of psychological baggage, if you like. I'd, I'd developed some stuff for myself back from a very, very early stage in my life. I mean, I can remember back to being three or four. And, and remembering uh, an event where we, we sadly lost a child in our family through a house fire, as it was. It wasn't in this country, it was abroad, but, but certainly close family members. And I lived with the impact of that for the whole of my life. And I watched how that had such a huge impact on, on a very close family network. And to cut a long story short, I mean, effectively, uh, it was my cousin that died, and he was the only male other, other than me within the family network. So uh, I, I suppose as I grew up, I was seen to be him. And I developed, there was all sorts of stuff going on, as you can imagine with that. And it was difficult for, for my aunt and uncle to see me growing up mm -hmm. when their son sadly wasn't doing so. So I think there was some stuff going on there that I assumed um, an element of responsibility for myself, I think. And I think that was part of the reason why I joined the fire service. I, I saw you know, a child fatality and mm. it was something that I thought, Do you know, if I can be part of a team that can help prevent that, then it's a really, really positive and good thing to do, which all sounds very, very commendable. But actually, as the years ticked by, I recognised in myself that I developed a bit of an unnatural responsibility for preventing that same occurrence again in the future. And it's something that I, I can look on now and recognise that it, it grew within my mind and it started to play games with me and I assumed that responsibility and the pressure as I sort of moved through my, my service and I was in a role as, as Andy is now as a watch commander on a station. I can remember physically sort of lying there awake at night with a crescendo, like a wave of stress and, and anxiety building that I wasn't going to be able to step up to the plate and make all the right decisions and get mm. everything resolved to prevent that happening from another family, overlaid with the fact that I'd, I'd seen what that looked like from a family's perspective. So to cut a long story short, the, the shoulder operation and the knee operation happened. I physically had to stop and psychologically it all kind of built up on me. And I'd, I'll, I'll never forget the day as long as I live. It was the darkest period of my life. I was stood in the butchers that is probably about 400 metres from our house and I froze. 
I couldn't decide, and we talk about decision making and how stress and anxiety and all, all the other things that can impact on that. I was stood in front of the butchers, the shop was busy and I couldn't decide between bacon or sausages. Mm. That simple. And it was as if somebody had turned the volume down on my life. You know how you get the bits in a film where you get the, the wavy bit and it moves from one scene to another scene. I felt like that was physically happening to me. And the noise went down, I, my vision almost went, and it took me probably the best part of an hour to, mm. to actually get back home. Now, this was, this was all about 14 years ago, I think, that actual period. And, and looking back now, having sort of come out the other side of it and, and reflected on it and, and all the, the long, hard struggle that there was from that point to, to where I am now, I think I probably, I recognise that I'd suffered from bouts of depression through my life. Never been clinically diagnosed until I experienced what I experienced in mm. terms of this sort of breakdown. So what happened then was basically I went home, uh, I didn't answer the phone, I didn't open any mail, I wouldn't speak to any friends, I basically wouldn't speak to anybody other than my wife and bless them for my children, it must have been a really difficult period for them. But I went into shutdown for four months. P putting my hand up for help was one of the most challenging things I've ever done, recognising that you've got to say, I, I need some help here or else things are going to get really, mm. you know, how do you get back from this? And actually ringing the doctors, walking into the doctor's surgery, speaking to them about the psychological issues I was experiencing, nothing to do with the shoulder or the knee or anything else. And I must admit, I was exceptionally fortunate in the doctor that supported me. He, he just happened to be having a natural bent towards caring for people with mental health issues. And, and it was the right balance of care, robustness, challenge, support that, that really did help me. Um, but looking back, you can see, well, actually, there's, there's a, a historical element to this. And being well now, because for, for five years, sort of, at least it's been five years before I've had anything that I would describe as a, a sort of a, a period of, yeah. of depression or anything like that. But reality actually struck home for me. My, my, my sort of lifelong fear of child fatality actually came to a reality. It, it wasn't within the fire service context, but we lost my um, nephew about four years ago now to cancer. He was only age 10 and he was exceptionally close to me. I've got two gorgeous daughters, eldest daughters. He was the firstborn of my sister of four boys. Right. And he was the, the, the first closest thing I, I ever experienced having a son. And it was, you know, we, we were really, really close. The reason I make the point is, I think it's really easy, certainly for myself, I can only speak for my own sort of experiences, to, to actually look back on our history and, and the challenge is that that doesn't need to define our future. Mm -hmm. So despite everything that I experienced, all the long periods of being off work, the, the recognising and dealing with depression, building myself back up and, and refocusing, able to, able to um, sort me out in terms of how I actually dealt with that. And to be honest, I, I just honestly dealt with it. I spoke openly to my line manager, as you spoke about, Andy, and explained to them exactly the situation, where, where we were and what was happening. I was given the support and given the time. I had about four weeks off of work to, to actually deal with the end of life phase of, yeah. of him not being, um, obviously getting better. And then a very rapid return to work because I recognised in myself from previous experiences that that void, not, not being part of what was my normality, mm. was a huge impactor on me actually not getting sort of better and, and not getting well. So I think that's, that's why I sort of, I, I made that point. And I think it's really important that you look at that and you say, look, it's not about what happened yesterday. It's about what we've learned along the way and where, we, where we're going to be tomorrow. So I think I've, I've made a note of some simple truths that I feel would be good to, to sort of share. I think the first thing I'd say is it, your perception is just that. It, it's not fact. Um, and be aware that most people <laughs> won't even consider you, let alone think what you think they might be thinking about you. Because they're busy getting on with their own lives, and, and rightly so but your perception can cause all sorts of barriers for you and you create all sorts of things. And that, how you interpret. Absolutely, that aren't real. And 
even if people do have an opinion about you, it's just an opinion and it doesn't actually mean it's right. So being able to be strong enough to be aware of your own self mm. and recognise that people may have an opinion but they don't actually have all the facts, that's fine, it's just what it is, it's an opinion. Um, I think it's really, really, really important to be honest and open um, and use your experience in matter-of-fact conversations. That's why I'm sat here today. Because I think if we can do that and just talk to colleagues about experiences, whether it be depression, whether it be anxiety, whether it be stress, whatever it is, if you use that in normal conversation, I think it permissions an environment where it's safe to do so. And that, that for me is really important in sitting here, certainly in the role that I'm performing at work now, and I suppose the point I'd like to make on, on this particular bit is when I went off sick with stress and, and depression, I was in the role that Anne is in now. And I had a conscious choice. I thought, I'm going to have to leave the service. I can't carry on doing this. I can't perform professionally in my role and competently do what I want to do whilst, whilst you know, Dealing moving with forward. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I chose to stay and do something different. And, and I refocused my career and I decided, actually, I want to put other people's perceptions of me to one side and grab my own potential because mm -hmm. I think I could step into a more senior leadership role. And it was as a result of that experience that brought me into the role that I'm in now. And I think I really value that to, to bring me here. But it is being honest. And now I'm lucky that I'm in the position where I think I hope I want to be able to sort of strike some organisational change in terms of how we can create an, an atmosphere that is open for people to, to come and discuss that. And normalises it. Totally. But I think that the other point with that is be vulnerable. Mm. You know, so talking about some of the stuff I'm talking about today for individuals is really, really quite challenging. I think that vulnerability is actually a strength, but there's a key here that I think you need to know when the time is to be vulnerable because you can't do it too quickly because you've got to protect yourself from, from obviously worsening or, or not getting better. Um, and also I find that if you speak out about your personal experiences you can become a lightning rod and other people will then share their experiences which can be quite challenging so it's to make sure that if that happens you can, you've got somewhere where you can seek support to kind of talk about that as well. Absolutely and I think certainly my experience of the fire service and being on a watch environment and being within the service we're in I think it's particularly you know, where we've got male dominated teams, that vulnerability, that honesty and, mm. and openness is really quite challenging and something we do struggle with. So I'm hoping that this sort of openness will help people have those discussions. That's the point of being here today, isn't it? Well, in terms of since we've launched the Blue Light programme and I've been speaking to personnel within the fire service, everything everyone said, if there's one thing you can achieve over the year long programme, it's to make it okay to say I'm right. not okay. Yeah. So that's what everybody's saying, really. Well, let's hope so. Yeah. Um, some of the other things I've picked up along the way, you know, as you've said, we, we are emotional beings, and as males in a uniformed organisation, we perhaps struggle with that a little bit. Um, but it's those emotions that have an effect on us and the people around us. Remember, it's the emotion is fine, it's one thing, but it's how we respond to that emotion that actually causes some of the damage and some of the problems. Mm -hmm. So learning to sit with emotion and recognise I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling happy, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling stressed, whatever it is, you know, don't let the emotion necessarily define the outcome okay. and your reaction. Um, recognise that we, we all get stressed at times. Pressure is something that is a real motivator for some individuals and for others it will be, you know, quite stressful. So it's finding the right level for you, mm. but not making the assumption that your level is right for the next person. Well, it fluctuates. I think pressure is one thing, but that point when it becomes stress is where you feel what's being asked of you is more than you've got the resources or the capability to, to match. And, what and that is can be quite individual. Totally. And, and what is you know, pressure for Andy may well be stress for me. Mm. And that's something we've got to be really, really mindful of. Absolutely. Um, the other thing, and this was a real stumbling block for me and something that I, it took me quite a while to get my head around, is that the adrenaline that is released into our bodies as a result of the job we do within the emergency lights um, and fire service, it has the same physiological effect on our body as, as stress does. Mm. So it's recognising that adrenaline is there for a purpose, mm -hmm. embracing it and using it to get you through whatever it is that you might be doing in terms of a traumatic incident. Mm -hmm. 
And, and there is a very subtle difference between a, a stress reaction and an adrenaline fueled reaction. And, and switching onto that is something that has really, really helped me and, and learning to embrace that. You talked about keeping active. Mental and physical well-being for me have been very, very closely linked. So you've, you've got to do that. I mentioned about how difficult it was to, to sort of get the help, but there's plenty of help out there now. There's, there's critical after instant counselling, there's welfare services that all sorts of um, services have. There's indirect line support, there's coaching and mentoring, there's peer support. So long as we own the space, mm. there's plenty of it out there, but, but people just need to step across the line and recognise either when a colleague might need that support and a gentle nudge in the right direction, or when you as an individual might need it. Okay. Um, <laughs> the other point I'd like to make is that, you know, we need to view our, our minds just like we would any other muscle. So in terms of work and capacity, you know, there's not many of us, I say not all of us, but there's not many of us that would go out and run a marathon every day. So in terms of work, you know, treat your mind in the same way. Mm. You can't be flat out permanently, constantly under huge pressure and work demands and perform at the same level. You've got to manage your work and your life balance to enable you to create the space to be your best. Yeah. So consider it the same way as you would your legs and you can't run that marathon every single day. It's just not going to happen. No, absolutely. Something that's, that's probably a bit more of a sensitive thing that I've, I've recognised back when I was not well at all is, you know, it's very easy to sort of have a drink and, and think that alcohol is going to make it better in the moment. Well, right there and then it might soothe it a little bit, but actually after that it's going to make it worse because alcohol is a, a, a depressant and it's something that is very, very easy to slip into a habit of, it feels not very pleasant, I need to have a drink to help me feel better and to relax. Mm. Well you know, the honest fact is that's not the case and we've got to be mindful of that and recognise, am I having a drink because I'm enjoying having a drink and I'm socialising and being with friends or am I having a drink because actually today's been really unpleasant and that's why I'm having a drink. So I think people need to be really tuned into that. It's a bit of a taboo subject, I know, and, and something that a lot of people, myself included, years ago could get quite defensive about when your wife may say to you, are you sure that's a good idea? You know. Mm. The honesty is, the build-up of that over a period of time isn't going to help you either. So you've no. got to really be aware of that. Uh, and if it feels too much, take the action you probably deep down know you've got to take, but don't want to. You know, visit your doctor, seek alternative therapy, find what works for you. You know, and try not to be a, a victim. And and I suppose that's that's it. When I say not a victim. I don't mean that harshly, I mean don't be a victim of the circumstance. I think it's really important to recognise we've all got choices. Mm. All of us have got individual choices and some of us may choose to tolerate stuff that we think we're able to tolerate. If you tolerate too much, you may get to the point, and hopefully people don't, that you find yourself in the position I was in where you stood at the butchers and it's out of your control at that point. And if it does get to that point, it's something that you know is, is potentially avoidable if we take preventative care of ourselves. And that's something I would urge people to do, is recognise the early warning signs and, and perhaps do something about it. Yeah, before the problem spiral. Yeah, so I suppose the only thing that I'd, I'd finish on, and I suppose it's the reason that I'm sat here now today, is I think it's really, really, really important that, and I hope that as a result of this and other work that MIND are doing, that, that managers within the fire service, blue light services, police, ambulance, coast guard, whoever it may be, feel better enabled to step into their own authenticity, share their experiences, be honest about what they've done, whilst maintaining a professional, competent, you know, exterior of this is where we're at now, to enable those discussions. I think that's part of the authentic leadership problem that, that we need to address today to, to create those safe spaces. And that's, and that's what I hope will happen, yeah, absolutely. No. Thank you, that was really, um, really um, helpful for you to kind of share what you've been through. Um, one question I have for you both, um, some, a tool that we promote to employers 
around giving one-to-one -one support to people that they, they manage, they employ and so on. Our wellness action plans, so it comes from the health world where someone was living with a mental health problem. They would draw up a plan with their health professional which talks about, well, what do I need to keep myself mentally healthy? What are the early warning signs that I might be struggling with poor mental health? Um, what are the potential triggers that would cause that? And then what are the steps I should take and what are the steps that my health professional should take to support me? So we've um, kind of um, used that as a basis for a tool that you can use in the workplace that you draw up with your manager to say, okay, this is what I need to do to keep me mentally healthy at work. This is what could cause me to have poor mental health or experience stress at work. This is what I need to do if I am feeling stressed or feeling like I'm experiencing poor mental health. And this is what's helpful for you to do or for the organisation to do to support me. Now, given where you are in your services, do you think that's something that could be useful to roll out? Do you think that it's kind of the start of the conversation within fire and rescue services so that would be a bit much? Or do you think it's something that could be beneficial in, in some way? Well, certainly from my perspective, I, I think there's definitely room for, for that sort of tool. I think it would be beneficial. I think we sort of need to have a look at it in its fullest depth to understand how it can how it can work and support. But anything I think that can normalise, mm -hmm. you know, we wouldn't bulk in any way, shape, or form if we had a, a return to work plan from a physician from someone that's had a broken femur. Yeah, we wouldn't think twice about it. You know, this is what I need work to do. This is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. This is where I want to get to. Everybody would be really happy. Because of the stigma associated with mental health, that's the bit that we've got to break through. Yeah, and I don't see it as being and there's a lot. Different. There's more you can do as a line manager with <coughs> someone who's been off with a mental health condition than there is if they've been off with a physical condition. Yeah. And like you said, it's quite straightforward, isn't it? It's a physical return to work program, broken femur. We know what we're going to do, yeah. but but it becomes a little bit daunting, I suppose, as a as a manager when you think actually you can have a you don't, maybe you don't realise you can have a positive effect in getting someone back to work. Maybe you know you, you may you might be going through it. It might be helping someone with a toolkit, but you might be doing it quite clumsily. You might not be you know you you, you may be actually making the problem worse mm. um, rather than making a positive difference. You you've, you've been given a, a set of principles to follow, a policy, a procedure, but you might not actually be helping someone back to work mm. but but anything which opens up the conversation and and you can use as a tool to to get people talking about mental health is fantastic so and we don't ha really have a great deal of conversation starts on it yeah so if it's something which which might help do that I well, know because I was just thinking that what's good about them is that it's very individual so for mm. example your experience of losing a family member mm. in a fire you know that's something you could capture that you know if I have to deal with a call like that that's something I would find really personal and quite potentially triggering rather than maybe dealing with something else. So I think it's just trying to see if the, you know you can have that understanding about what might be more challenging for that person than mm. someone else. So then you can then have an agreed package of support ready or an agreed approach about how to support someone if they have gone through that. So I just wanted to get your well, you, views really. You, you, might, you might find, sorry, sorry you might find if you know, you're trying to encourage people to talk about mental health but you've got two or three people in the room with you who, who don't want to say anything. But then they might want to talk to you. They don't want to talk necessarily in a, in a room full of other people. And, and well, no, and, that's about uh, you know between a manager and you know, yeah, yeah, team yeah, leader. Yeah. It's like very individual. But you mean just talking in general about mental health? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's hard for some people. They don't want to talk about that in front of a group of people. Mm. So you, you can have those sort of couple of a, a five minute conversation around the back of a pump. You know, with no one else about a, a, a job, or it could be sitting down quite formally talking about it but, but predominantly somebody who doesn't want to open up and talk about it isn't going to respond particularly well I'd imagine to having a formal environment um, just talking about generally about how they're feeling so, mm. so it's, there might be other ways you, uh, ways you can go about doing it but that's about knowing the people that work for you hopefully recognising the difference in them and finding that time to, mm. to have a conversation with them. Um, thank you both, I think that was really useful in terms of you sharing your experiences of you know working with a colleague and supporting them and then your own personal experiences and then what that means in terms of you know what the fire rescue service should be doing to kind of address these issues. Um, with the Blue Light program we're determined to reach as many fire personnel as we possibly can so please ensure your colleagues are made aware of the program, the support and services we have available and of course these webinars to help them kind of learn more about this issue. 
So in terms of um, further information, we know that you know, mental well-being is just as important as physical well-being and for emergency service personnel you need to maintain both in order to you know, remain fit and confident and healthy to do your job. As you work in the emergency services, it's especially important that you look after your mental well-being and to help you to do that we've produced um, some information. So you can access our booklet, Managing Mental Well-Being for Fire Personnel on our website. It explains in further, in further detail how to build your resilience and where to go for support. We're also producing further titles, so please check our Blue Light web pages for more information. And we hope that you have found viewing this webinar useful. We have produced additional webinars in this series, one entitled General Mental Health Awareness and one um, around managing mental health in the workplace, both of which are available to view now. Please also take a few minutes to give us your feedback by completing the short survey that immediately follows this webinar. Your feedback would be really um, appreciated because it's important that we ensure the programme meets your needs. As mentioned previously, MIND has also created resources specifically for the Blue Light Services. These are available to you and your colleagues, so please share the guidance as it may be of help to someone. And please note the details at the end of this webinar um, as they will signpost you to further sources of support and information, including um, MIND's dedicated Blue Light info line. Thank you for watching.